From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. And that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. As we've explored in previous episodes, our species knows roughly when and how uh, human beings first reached the continent we know of as North America. But we still continue to search for more concrete God, this is going to be such a horrible pun later, answers about who these people were. And as most of our fellow conspiracy realists know, many of the things children are taught about in North American history later turned out to be either misleading or wholly false. Uh, the best example of this is probably the tale of Christopher Columbus or Cristobal Colon. Uh, did, without dating ourselves, guys, do you remember being taught about Christopher Columbus uh, in grade school, elementary, middle, et cetera? Didn't he sail the ocean blue in 1492? Oh, forever. That's the one I, that, yeah, that's the Burned one I remember. Into our psyches. Uh, yeah, that that that's what I remember. But yeah, the, the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria, all that stuff. And uh, I remember how exciting it was to say that quickly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Outside of that, you know. As far as the actual explorations and, you know, who was behind them, I vaguely remember the details, but, uh, but yeah. Yeah, it, it's strange because a lot of, a lot of kids, uh, especially in the West, in the U.S. and Canada, uh, were taught uh, a somewhat simplified version of history, right, of European transatlantic exploration toward this continent uh, and toward South America as well, uh, but Obviously, current historical research indicates Columbus was far from the first European to reach what we call North America, right? Uh, but if this explorer was not the first, then who was? According to uh, one group of researchers, the answer may be found in a slab of rock located, of all places, in modern-day Douglas County, wait for it, Minnesota. That's called the Kensington Rune Stone. Uh, you, Noel, you pointed out this uh, reminded you a bit of the Georgia Guide Stones, and I definitely see the similarities. But first off, Minnesota, it's inland. It's far, far away from where a ship would be at that time, right? Well, it, it is, but but it, it does offer us a really great opportunity because uh, it's in Minnesota and it involves uh, Nordic or Scandinavian runes. I think we get to do both a Minnesota and a Scandinavian accent. It is, it is pretty much between Minneapolis and Fargo. I mean, it's like almost in between there, mm -hmm. a little closer to Fargo. Hmm. So... Here are the facts. What are we talking about? I, I know some of us listening, uh, maybe our heads exploded when they said, all right, well, finally, they're going to give us the truth about the rune stone, which is a cool, very uh, high sword and sorcery fantasy sounding word. Uh, it dates back to 1898. There is a Swedish immigrant. His name is Olaf Ullmann, and he... Like late in that year, he he said that he had stumbled across a mysterious stone while he was clearing trees and stumps from some farmland he had just acquired. Uh, Olaf himself came to the U.S. in 1879, so he had been here for a while. Uh, this wasn't like he didn't just get off of a ship and then go find a tree with a stone in it. So he was he was just like an enterprising farmer. And uh, we know the story of how he found the stone. Oh, yes. The tale goes that Olaf found this stone uh, near the crest of a small knoll. Not that knoll, but a, an actual K-N-O-L-L. -L. And it was, when he found it, it was laying face down. So you, you don't even really understand what it is, right? Uh, at least when you first look at it, oh, there's a stone there. It was tangled up in the root system of this tree that was there on the knoll, a poplar tree. And the, this, the way this tale goes, 
you'd think, okay, it was just one day, but experts now can't really agree on what day it was actually found when it was truly discovered. They put it somewhere between August of 1898 and the 8th of November of that year. So that's a pretty big chunk of time at at, at some point at which it was discovered. And, you know, and it's really one of those things. If you're hanging out somewhere near a tree, maybe by your house, it doesn't matter where you live. If you're if you've got a root system going on in some trees, you dig a little bit, just a tiny bit or even not dig, just brush away some leaves and and stuff that's just been lying on the ground. You might find some fairly big stones. Yeah, yeah. It's not abnormal. It's not unusual to find stones in someone's By a roots. tree. <laughs> right, yeah, there we go. We'll, we'll workshop it. We'll workshop it. But, but yeah, you're right. Uh, according to the story, there's a reason that this stone didn't just get, you know, tossed aside or used to build some rough structure on the farm. It's because Olaf's son, Edward, who was 10 years old at the time, noticed something weird. Uh, he could just make out, now, of course, this is covered in dirt, right? If this story is true, he could just make out what appeared to be markings, uh, not not just the patterns of time or erosion, but what seemed to be purposeful markings on one side of the stone. So whoosh, 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 they clean it off. That's the sound effect for cleaning stuff off. Everybody knows that one. So they're, they're whoosh, whoosh, whoosh on the stone and uh, they find these markings are an inscription and it appears to be made by human beings. And it appears that they have written in some, some sort of message for posterity uh, in some kind of language, but the farmers don't recognize the alphabet, which will also be important later. And their farm is in a rural area, like the closest settlement is Kensington, Minnesota. Yeah, and this word spread uh, pretty quickly through Douglas County. On New Year's Day of 1899, the mayor of Kensington, Minnesota, a Swedish-born gentleman by the name of John P. Hedberg, uh, maybe a a distant relative of Mitch, I don't know, it's possible. Uh, Well, uh, John P. wrote a letter recounting this story to Svenska Amerikanska Posten, which is a fancy way of saying uh, Swedish American newspaper, essentially. And that was the name of this Swedish American newspaper in Minneapolis. And Hedberg, um, in his correspondence, enclosed a penciled sheet showing reproductions of the 219 characters from the inscription that we're talking about. Uh, In his letter, in the body of the letter to Hedberg, um, he guessed that the inscription might be in ancient Greek, which was a language that he couldn't read. Right. But he was try- yeah, right. Yeah. But um, he wasn't trying to put one over on this guy. Um, he was genuinely you know, interested. From what you can tell from his letter to the paper's editor and publishers, Hedberg was really just trying to get a little help solving this mystery. He thought maybe there would be some experts there that could, um, you know, point him in the right direction at the very least. He wanted to know on the surface, what was going on? Ah, on the surface of this strange stone that they found. You're literally right. <laughs> on the surface, <laughs> sc- scraped into it with some sort of sh- pointy object, right? Uh, you know, we're going to get into it later, but you write to any paper, doesn't matter how, you know, well they are known throughout the land. You write to a publication and you say, look at this thing I found. It's really strange. What do you think it is? I mean, you're letting you're letting that publication know that it exists and it could be it is a mystery, right? No I matter see. what. Just yeah. planting that seed. As well, we also, it's the mayor of a of a rural area. So this is one of the strangest things to happen probably during this mayor's tenure uh but also let's let's assume uh that the editors and publishers get a lot of letters in the post you know uh maybe there's a two-headed cow report maybe uh the crops are failing or overly abundant the reason the publisher reads this letter is because he is a friend of the mayor the guy who publishes the paper yeah, or you know that time that uh, that one big fella threw that little fella in the wood chipper. Remember when that happened? That mm. was a big story at the time. 
Was that Especially the Fargo it, thing? That was a Fargo ref. Yeah, well, that was in Fargo. yeah, but when it happened in the 1800s, remember they didn't have uh, electrically powered yeah. wood chippers. It so the wood chipper was a guy. <laughs> that was a hand crank. <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, yeah. So, yeah, so they, they spread this. And I, I appreciate your point about possible motivations there, Matt, because, of course, the art of the con teaches us that if you want to pull a good con – if this guy's motivations were anything less than sincere, uh, then you can't show all your cards at once, right? The mayor is talking to a personal friend of his. So he, uh, he in the most objective way possible, just says, okay, here we go. What do you think? I think it might be ancient Greek, but I don't speak it. Because, you know, if you want to reel people in, you let them feel like they are making the decisions you control them making. Anyway, the stone is at least real. It's not a, uh, it, the stone itself, its existence is not a hoax. Uh, the same way that, you know, we went through a spate of uh, people claiming a few years ago to have found Bigfoot's corpse. And those they had inevitably, something. Yeah, they had something. They had something. In one case, it was like a gorilla suit in, in a cooler. Uh, but there is a real stone here, and we have very great descriptions of it. It's uh, made of a hard gray type of sandstone called uh, gray whack, W-A-C-K-E. Uh, it's, it's about the size of like your typical tombstone. I mean, a gravestone, not the pizza, uh, which isn't bad. Uh, and it's, it's this irregular rectangle shape, irregular rectangular shape. Uh, it weighs about 202 pounds it's 30 inches high, 30, 31 inches high, 16 inches wide, and about five and a half to six inches thick. So it's a, it's hefty. It's not something you casually carry around. And it seems like it would be a difficult thing to lose in the first place, right? Uh, but again, our species loses cities, civilizations, entire eras of history. Who were the sea peoples? Anyway. Mm, we continue uh, had, asking that question for the rest of this show. Like, yeah, that, that, that it exists. I just, okay. As long as we can just keep saying sea peoples. I don't know why that just strikes me as delightful. The sea people. I, I just think of, I picture, you know, underwater dwelling types with gills and webbed Ooh. feet. I picture sea monkeys. I'm just going to be honest. It was hard for me not to say that during the Bronze Age collapse thing. I was pulling up images of uh, old school sea monkeys, which yeah. I think are really some kind of shrimp. <clears throat> it's all but, sea persons for me. You know, it's all like, persons. Uh, mer, mer persons, I guess. <laughs> yeah, mer person, bird person, all the hits, all the good ones. Uh, so it does, the, everybody agrees this stone exists. It has something carved upon it, right? It has something carved into the face of the stone. Uh, and the if you look at pictures of this, which are widely available online, you'll see that it, the front face looks partially damaged. So it's possible there was more to this original message and now, now we get to the, the very strange part. We know what the message says, sort of. We have a bunch of linguists uh, who have been looking at this since 1899, at least, and they, they agree, kind of, on this message. But Olaf, first, he didn't, according to him, he initially thought that this was some kind of Indian almanac. Uh, by when she meant Native American almanac. But later people said, uh, wait, those look like runes. Was that a quotation sound or an engraving sound? That was a quotation <laughs> sound. Okay, cool. Just an engraving sure. sound is more like a... Oh, no, but you made a sound earlier in the episode. Was that a scrubbing sound you made? It was that's like a, a cleaning. That's a... <laughs> okay. Right, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just clarifying our, our, our sonic terms here. For, for <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it was runes. Mm. Runes. You... Um, I don't know. On this show, we've encountered runes many a time. I think most commonly when dealing with research on the Nazi party. I think, at least for me, that's when a type of runes uh, we've been encountering quite frequently. Well, the notion that they have power, right? Isn't that right. part of it? Right. The words have power in quite a literal way. Uh, yeah, runes are used in various magical systems or traditional beliefs. They have also been uh, kind of, uh, what's the word, appropriated by political movements or by metal bands. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and maybe they would say that's not appropriation. But in the case of the Nazi Party, it's definitely appropriation. 
Well, but just just from a form factor, from like if you're thinking about fonts or something, the runes such as these do. There is something about them that is striking, um, almost. I don't know, almost in the way the hieroglyphics have the same kind of feel, where it feels like there's more inside whatever's written or inscribed than just letters. It it feels that way. It reminds me of the same with a lot of. Uh... Um, Asian characters, you know, where there there feels like there's an imbued meaning um, within the system. I mean, it's much more, th- there's more to it than just a straightforward A shape or a letter. You know, it feels like it's got, you can, in the way that, that like certain Japanese characters can tell a story, you know, with, with some brushstrokes, you know, or there's a lot more contained within that one character than with just a letter that would then be used to spell out a word, right? Yeah, runes are crazy. I, I got, uh, I watched I've been rewatch. I've been watching like two Halloween movies, one to two Halloween movies a day in October, and I stumbled upon um, a film that I'd never heard of called Spell, which is about a uh, a guy with OCD whose spouse passes away. None of this is a spoiler, and so he just sort of impulsively goes to Iceland, and he gets really wrapped up in Icelandic folklore and runes, and I fell into. Uh, I fell into the rabbit hole of Icelandic traditional beliefs, and I spent, I swear, I spent like two hours uh, this past weekend wondering how we could make it a Stuff They Don't Want You to Know episode until I said, I'm just going to have to, I'm just going to have to be content to name drop that thing because there's not a conspiracy. First place I I ever remember hearing about runes was in the... uh the Hobbit movie where, where mm-hmm. the, the one of the gnomes is like, those are rune stones, you know, <laughs> that was the first. And then like, you know, cause they, they do have power. They're also in a lot of obviously like RPG type games They're in legend of Zelda. There are a way you can power up uh, a sword by adding a rune stone to it. That gives it a special property or whatever outside the, the, <laughs> the scope of today's discussion. But still the point is that language, can be imbued with meaning and power uh, in the right hands, at least in theory. I really hope some of you also teleported on runes in Ultima Online the way I did, because that was one of my favorite things. So let's just let's just talk about these runes for a little bit. Uh, runes in general, it's an ancient North European writing system, right? It's probably first developed in the second century CE and most likely under Roman influence. They were also uh, taught in several places throughout the world, specifically in Scandinavian um, schools, school children in the 19th century were learning what runes were, um, at least in a general sense, in early education in that way, um, more as a, a history lesson, I think. I mean, that's that's my understanding. It would, it would be more of a, let's learn about our, our history, our past. No, it's a scholomance thing. They're teaching those kids spells. Oh, They're I mean, teaching I them- hope. <laughs> occult power over the elements uh, <laughs> out of find fortune in love and uh, lay enemies to waste. No, you're right, though. Runes are a real thing. Uh, they're very, very popular in fiction, but they are very much a real thing. Uh, and they were taught in various parts of Scandinavia to school children in the 1800s, at least. We know that for sure. Uh, so here is... The translation, this is, again, this is a generally accepted translation. There are going to be people who go back and forth about the specifics here. Uh, But it's, it's like a, uh, it's a confession. Ah, We don't need a, we don't need a prologue here. Here it is. We are eight Goths and 22 Norwegians on an exploration valley from Vinland through the West. We had camp by a lake with two scaries. That small rocky islands, one day's journey north from this stone. We were out and fished one day. After we came home, we found ten of our men, red with blood and dead. AVM, standing probably for Ave Virgo Maria or Hail Virgin Mary, save us from evil. We have ten of our party by the sea to look after our ships. Fourteen days' journey from this island, year 1362. Whoa, 1362. These runes are describing a couple of different journeys that were taken, but one specific exploration journey. I like how they put that from Vinland through the West. Hmm. We're going to spend Vinland? some time. Is that the same as Finland? Mm, we're going to, we're going to spend some time discussing what that may or may not mean. 
I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> where is Vinland, you say? Uh, but yeah, really interesting stuff, like giving almost in uh, sunken treasure or in a hidden treasure map kind of vibe, like we're this, we're this distance away from this stone from where we were. We're also this other distance in this other direction away from this stone for this other thing. Fascinating that this thing this message would end up etched in stone in this place. Hmm. Well, why is it there? How did it get there? What does it mean? We'll tell you. Well, at least as much as we know. After a word from our sponsor. And we're back. Um, talking about potentially magical artifacts found in Minnesota. Uh, not too, too, too terribly far from Minneapolis, where we know a magical creature once dwelled, uh, Prince, the purple one, um, but unrelated to any Goths or Norwegians that I know of. But the Minneapolis Journal uh, actually scooped the Swedish paper that we discussed, the Swedish language paper that we discussed earlier um, on that translation, Referencing said uh, Goths and uh, Norwegians, eight and 22 in number. Um, and it was kind of a thing. Um, the stone itself was put on display in a bank, uh, although this account uh, we found on the Internet incorrectly refers to the bank as a drugstore. Um, and it's super important to note that Olaf Omen never actually was looking to get paid for his discovery. The Minnesota Historical Society uh, actually has a bill of sale showing that Omen sold the stone to them for 10 American dollars in 1911, uh, which would be around 300 bucks in 2020, closer to $260. Wow. So what's the deal? Where do the facts and the fiction meet? And, and of which is there more? <laughs> this <laughs> is the question I think we have for today. The first thing I would put forward is who's to say it wasn't a combination bank and drug store? I mean, right? every, everybody's seen those. Money well, is I mean, a drug. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you certainly will see banks in grocery stores and drugs and pharmacies in grocery stores, though I cannot say I have ever, Matt, seen a bank in a freestanding drug store. But, or maybe we just need a pop up. Uh, you know, banking institutions are stressful for a lot of people. Maybe we need a pop-up pharmacy uh, right after you sign 30 years of your life away in a loan. I think, I think there's probably a law against that for good reason, but uh, it's not a bad idea. There's a lot of money to be made. And then you can go next door to the combination Pizza Hut Taco Bell and uh, get a little snack. Seriously, yes, absolutely. But also... You guys are familiar with the concept of minute clinics, right? Where yeah. a drugstore essentially will have uh, a physician's assistant Urgent or care someone. type situation, right? But, but in a drugstore, mm -hmm. why aren't there minute clinics with psychiatrists in them? Like Having a, a drugstore that has Good a psychiatrist call. installed just waiting for you? Come, come to me yeah, and I will prescribe the... <laughs> probably because... I would say probably because it's tougher to... Uh, help uh, heal a wounded mind than it is to help bandage up a broken arm. Or, I, I or don't, I don't mean, I don't mean to actually do good for any patient oh, that comes okay. in. Just, I just meant to, to push more pills. <laughs> I got it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let the, uh, let the Oxycontin tycoons know, right? There's a yeah. new revenue stream, just like <laughs> oil companies figured out plastic. Uh, I hope those words don't come back to haunt us. Uh, there is a point, though, that I don't want to lose before okay, okay. we get too far from the translation. Okay. And that is that the Goths are Swedes. Goth is a word for Swede. They're not the... Uh, they're not the the motley crew from Letter Kenny or South Park. Right. Uh, they're, they're not. They're, they're not Swedish demure people. cure fans. You know, with uh, emo haircuts and potential like chain mail belts or something like that. Black fingernail polish. They may have had chain mail. Um, oh, but, that's true. Yeah, likely on more than their belts, though. I would. I would. <laughs> I would imagine so, uh, unless it was something of uh, religious or spiritual cultural significance. Yeah. Uh, this is an excellent question about fact versus fiction, because if the Kensington rune stone is what uh, its believers say it is, and if the message on it is true and is from 1362, then it's hugely important 
for our understanding of North American history. Forget that of world history. This would be a big deal because how, how would uh, how how would this group of uh, Swedish people and Norwegian people, Vikings working together, how would they how would they reach the Midwest from uh, Vinland? Right, even though they say they did it at a great personal cost, they paid in blood for this trip. Um, it's still it's it's still a long journey maybe we maybe we should pause for just a second to talk about venland uh we've been throwing this around uh you've you've probably heard of greenland you've probably heard of iceland and maybe the nifty little story behind their names uh venland is is kind of in that same headspace it's an area of north america that was explored by norse vikings uh leif erikson landed there around 1000 CE. So, you know, you don't have to be a math doctor to know that's way before Columbus. I mean, that's, it's incredible to have that inscribed, you know, uh, allegedly in the 1300s. It, so I guess what I'm trying to wrap my head around, I was reading this story from the, is it, what is it? The Minnesota post. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're discussing Vinland and the route through the West from Vinland and what, where that would be from, where, where it would actually be located. And I'm genuinely a little bit confused because it seems as though it's a bit unknown where Vinland is. Ben, can, do we have, maybe I just don't have it in my research, like actually where it is located on so, in current U S. Yeah. So right now, um, Right now, the popular consensus is that uh, what we what was described as Vinland by Leif Erikson and Co. is probably an area that includes Newfoundland and the Gulf of Saint Lawrence, and maybe goes as far as New Brunswick. So, really, it's it's Canadian. Um, okay, okay, but. But but it is it is a wide range, and it is accepted as fact that uh, that these. People arrived there in 1000 CE. We just don't know what happened in the 1300s. Well, if you definitely want to learn an historically accurate account of what Vinland was, there is a, an anime manga series called Vinland Saga. Uh, so that would be the place to go. I'm kidding. But it is interesting when uh, uh, a country like Japan, uh, you know, portrays a culture like the, the 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 Viking type situation. It's very I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm intrigued by this uh, because it does appear to be like Viking ships and swords and that kind of hijinks. So it looks pretty interesting. But um, so what would what land mass would we attribute it to? Like, if does it still exist? Or I'm having I mean, a hard North time America? finding anything about. Oh, it's just North America, just Ooh. part of it. Okay, interesting. It would be like the eastern upper upper eastern coast of the North American continent. Uh, but from what we know in the earliest accounts of Vinland, it was described as, uh, it was first written about in 1075, and it was described as these remote islands. So imagine you get close, you find some islands, and you think, we've gone really far. We should turn around. They didn't really, from what we understand, they they did not know the enormity of the landmass that they were very, very close to. If that makes sense. So Vinland, at this point, is, um, we should also say, it's the idea of these early Viking explorers in 1000 CE, uh, it, it's a very popular idea. It's in a lot of conversation. It's in the zeitgeist in the 1890s, in Europe and in the U.S. So someone would probably no, uh, uh, someone in Minnesota would have heard this story, especially given the massive Swedish population. Uh, they would have been familiar with this. And that's why it got so much uh, interest from the media. There was a flurry of investigations. We're talking scholars and linguists. They dive into this description. And they're fighting back and forth. Like, what kind of runic system is this? How old is it? That's the big question, right? And then historians and scientists are doing the same kind of thing that we we were just doing, where they're they're essentially pulling up a map, and they're going, okay, fictional boat. How does it get to Minnesota? You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. 
Well, dude, there's it's it's fascinating if you just read that translation. Doesn't it call the place where the tablet ends up an island and not just a hill? Right? So that right that alone makes the mind start wondering, well, wait, w- was this flooded? And unless you know the historical record of the area, you have extremely accurate information on that, your mind may think, well, perhaps it was. A lot of, the, a lot of this was flooded at some point, even if it was only in a, on a temporary basis, um, to where this, this whole area could be traversed by ship or by boat rather than on, on foot, on land. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, we know the geography can change, right? Uh, especially over over time. Uh, that's the thing. If you're if you're hearing about this and you're not a scholar of ancient languages that are somewhat obscure, and if you're not uh, a forensic expert or a professional historian, then this sounds like it's at, at, at the very least. It sounds like it's an interesting thing. And it sounds very possible. The stone itself ended up getting sent to some professionals, especially one Professor George O. Kerm, who was a philologist at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. And so so he looks at it, he looks at this draft people are figuring out about based on what we know about the inscription. And when he looks at this first draft, he is, he's got a little spark of hope, right? Are we about to learn more about hidden history? But then he inspected the language on the stone itself. You know, when he did it, when he did a firsthand investigation, he got really, really puzzled. And it led him and many others to ask, what the heck is going on? What is the provenance of this stone? We'll answer the question definitively. After a word from our sponsor. Here's where it gets crazy. Okay, we gotta say it. It's fake. What? No! Just like that. Just like that. It gets crazy, it's fake? (laughs) (laughs) Well, it gets a little crazier than that, but the stone itself is... 98%, 98.99% 98%, 98.99% a hoax. Uh, yeah. At least it might be an historical hoax, like the Shroud of Turin or something, spoilers. But uh, but this is proven pretty definitively. There are big problems with the stories. There's not just problems with the, uh, the story of the farmer finding it. There's a problem with the story that's on the stone. Map it, problems, it, right? Like route yeah. problems. You know? mm-hmm. And the farmer selling it for 10 bucks, even if it was 260 bucks. Come on. This is things incredible. 10 bucks. Yeah. Look, for the Vikings ships to have uh, made a 14 day journey from Alexandria. Um, to where they ended up, the only possible route they could have taken was from Hudson Bay, which is 800 miles as the crow flies. Longer, uh, if you take a more winding path like a river and having to pick up the boat and put it back down, uh, which is a, a word I learned today called portage, and um, a particularly difficult distance to manage in 14 days in the way that it was described here in, in, in this uh, on the stone. The route through the west from Vinland, that whole situation, uh, whose location in 1362 would have been unknown. Uh, That's a thing we've we've all kind of struggled with as we were trying to pick this thing apart. And no other record of this expedition has been found literally anywhere. Um, So why would explorers who had just suffered such a massacre stop to carve in these beautifully ornate uh, and organized characters this stone inscription? I would, you know, just to counter a little bit to that last part there. I mean, if maybe the belief is that all is lost, you want to warn anyone else who's going to be coming this way about something. Maybe you don't have enough information. So as one of the men is dying, he's carving furiously, trying to get a message into this stone before he leaves uh, or before his party leaves or and he perishes. Just putting it out there. That feels very video game like to me, or movie like. Right. But uh, 
just as a possible reason to make them look like that. Maybe a testament to the lives lost. Uh, there you go. Maybe some way to make a mark before they themselves disappeared. Uh, would say that we do need to point out there were no bodies found in the vicinity of the stone that we know of. Uh, and, and it's also, it's, it's a good question. We don't know why this would happen in a vacuum, why there would be no other, uh, no other secondary source. If it's a true story, then perhaps the grisly fact of the matter is that uh, the author, along with the, their cohort, all died. Maybe no one made it back to tell the tale of uh, their, you know, their their woefully unfortunate trip. But okay, so that's a that's a huge problem. The math. These, these folks were mavericks if they were able to if they, if they were able to uh, sail to this very specific place in a way that would have required them to at some point pick up their boats physically carry them across the ground, put them in another water source, and then continue on their merry way. That's a lot. Uh, but there's another problem with this story, and I hate to say it, it's a, it's a problem with the farmer. It's very, very strange. I'm not calling him a liar. Just say it's very strange that Olaf would not have recognized something familiar about runes. Because remember, he grew up in Sweden. This is during a time when Scandinavian children were often taught about runes. Uh, he was not a, I guess we wouldn't call him a highly educated man, but that doesn't make him unintelligent. He was literate. He had a small library at his house, and some of those books had, you guessed it, runes in them. Mm. Okay. So then we have to wonder if the inscription itself, the message, if it was genuine. Hmm. Right. Well, if someone were to inscribe something in, uh, what did we call it? That That's a fun word that we just, gray, uh, gray, crack, gray, whack. No, gray whack. If someone were to, you know, inscribe this thing in gray whack, they would have to at least have an understanding of what these runes meant, how to put them together. Uh, to form, you know, sentences with meaning. And, you know, if the farmer does have these books, he did grow up in a place where he learned uh, at least parts of this language. I don't know if he had the nerve or the wherewithal to pull up a prank or even a quick way to make 10 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> the I mean, worst way to make $10 ever. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of work to put in. <laughs> like, how long does it take to uh, look? I've never. Uh, oh, hmm. I imagine it would take a long time to carve something into stone, right? So, if you average out, this is uh, this is maybe us being cheapskates, but it's important. Yeah. <laughs> if you average out the uh, that ten dollars across however many hours it would have taken to make this, it's not a great gig. You know yeah. what I mean? Like Even not, if it's two, 260, like if you were being commissioned to build a piece of art in stone for $260, that feels that feels cheap to me for an ornate piece of stone, but I, I don't know. Hey, it's also kind of an odd prank, right? Like, I mean, obviously we're talking about it. Obviously it got some attention, you know, it was put up in the drugstore slash uh, bank, whatever, whichever one it was, combination drugstore bank. But... What, what do you think the uh, end game was? Just to make a fuss? Just to get people excited or riled up? That's a good question. There have been some people who guessed that this conspiracy, and it is a conspiracy if it's a hoax, uh, there have been some people who guessed that it had more than one, uh, involved more than one person, uh, that one of Oman's friends, a uh, pastor, a former pastor, named Sven Vogelblad, Vogelblad, uh, may have helped him out because Sven had a knowledge of runes. And according to a couple sources, again, this is touchy. This is like this is like the Syrian sources writing about the assassins, you know. Um, <laughs> there are sources who say that both of these guys, Sven and Olaf, didn't like academics. They didn't like the ivory tower. They resented him for some reason. So maybe this is like a little a little Philip toward them or, uh, you know, uh, a bite of the thumb. Just a quick Philip. 
Yeah, that's the word for it. We can do I know, that. I know. A, I love yeah. it. I, I just, I, I love, you know, I've we, never heard anyone in like 20, in the whatever this era is, refer to flipping someone a quick Philip. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know, it, it, it's funny. We, we mentioned at the top of the show how this sort of reminded me of the Georgia Guidestones. Um, I think one uh, misconception about the Georgia Guidestones is that they're a hoax, is that they're meant to be interpreted as some sort of ancient artifact, like some sort of a Stonehenge type situation. But, you know, it's certainly something that the, the mind might jump to when just seeing it cold, because they do appear to be these uh, ancient kind of carved, you know, granite slabs that, that very much resemble a Stonehenge. But obviously we know at the very least the, the mystery behind that is what the identity actually was of the man who paid to have them erected and designed. But we know that a man did have them erected, designed with full cooperation of the city and, the you know, uh, you know bought the plot of land and all that stuff. So that's different, um, but still very interesting in that they are both, you know, the, the Guidestones are sort of meant to resemble something that w- could be taken as ancient, but it serves a much more modern purpose. Um, th- I understand the meaning and the point behind the Guidestones. I don't understand the meaning and the point behind this. If it were a hoax, right? Right, right. Yeah, so that's, that, I mean, that's a key question because... Uh, we don't have definitive proof that Olaf Omen made these things as a jolly prank. In fact, he never admitted a hoax, uh, even unto his deathbed. Again, as we said, he wasn't, he clearly was not out to become wealthy from this. And he was adamant. He stuck to his story. Uh, He was steadfast about his version of events uh, until his death. And he stuck by the story, even when the academics that he reputedly resented came back with problems with the inscription itself. They first analyze it in 1899, right? Same year it gets reported. And a lot of these experts dismiss it as fake back then. They say there are too many discrepancies in the form and the vocabulary uh, because (laughs) they're like the Indiana Jones top men. They get together and they say, okay, look, We are experts in a very specific field, the known languages of 14th century Scandinavia, and we checked with each other, and none of us think this is legit. They were saying that back in 1899, early 1900s. Most experts since then have agreed. Uh, But even if you say, even if you say, well, maybe this person was just writing in a weird way, because Uh, around half of their friends were dead. It was a very trying time. They were very stressed out. Uh, Even if we accept that, we have to ask ourselves about the age of these things, the condition of the rock. Yeah. So they're, you know, they're picked up in 1889, right? And if if you're talking about, what is that, 500 years that they would have been laying there? Uh, Or, yeah more than 500 years that they had been laying there. You'd think that the stone inscriptions would have just been worn to nothingness or at least worn heavily after all that time of just the elements and laying there being, you know, scraped. I know it doesn't sound like much, but being scraped by roots and by dirt and as water runs underneath it every time it rains and all these other things. But the weird thing is though, to me is if it's laying on its face and it isn't directly being hit by rain and debris all that time. I don't know. I feel like it would degrade less so than if it was facing up. But but maybe that's just my ignorance as to how things actually get weathered um, and what 500 years can do to something. But, you know, I know that's certainly in question here. Why Why were the runes still so intact and seemingly pristine i see you're saying if it was like mounted like a tombstone upright then it would be spared more like then then if it were like uh you know mounted on the ground facing up then probably that amount of time the runes would have been completely wiped away you know uh, well I, I guess what i'm saying is because of how it was found i correct me if i'm wrong ben but i think it was found face down 
Yeah, like the runes, the case, you don't yeah. see the runes. You see just the rest of the, the gray whack stone. You pick it up and then you see the runes. Oh, that and certainly would have preserved it, I would imagine. That's my thought. But I know that experts at the time were just saying, I hear, you know, I hear what you're saying, Matt. This is what the experts would have said. I hear what you're saying, Matt. But we're talking about 500 years. <laughs> well, also over, yeah, over 500 years, would root systems of other trees not have broken engulfed it so yeah. yeah engulfed it broken more of the stone into bits uh or you know eroded it time wears on things on all the works of man uh so maybe we can say what about the most popular poplar tree in town in 1898 how old was the tree uh they did an interesting thing not super scientific uh the tree that held the stone was destroyed by 1910 uh, but people went back to the site. They looked around the area. They saw other uh, other poplar trees, like a nearby copes of poplar trees. And they, they had locals saying, okay, these poplars are around the same size. They're around the same age. And then uh, the experts knocked down some of those trees. And through the magic of dendrochronology, they figured out that those trees were probably between 30 to 40 years old. So uh, the age of that, if that gives us information about the age of the tree where the stone was supposedly found, then we know that uh, that root system had engulfed it within 30 to 40 years. Again, if, if this is true, because another person uh, who was at the excavation site later, who visited it, uh, a county school superintendent named Cleve Van Dyke, said, hold on. Those those trees are uh, only ten or twelve years old, mm. but you know he said that in a Minnesota accent. I imagine. <laughs> have, we thinking, have we attempted? Have we attempted a Nor a Nordic accent yet, or a Scandinavian? <laughs> ben, you you promised us a a Bjork off mic. Well, and, uh, and oh, what? We were talking oh, off. Oh, <laughs> we were talking I'm off sorry, mic, I don't uh, mean to throw you under the bjurs. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Worth it. Well, uh, I, but just yeah. to, I, I hear you about the trees like that. That makes a whole lot of sense as to why it would have end up, ended up where it was if those trees were only that old, right? The, just to jump back quickly to the inscription and the age possibly of that, there was, there was an analysis in 2003 done on the actual inscriptions, the runes that are you know inscribed into, into the rock. And there was a person, uh, Scott F. Walter, who conducted this analysis and you know, according to him and his study, they were around 200 years old. So that would put them in the 1800s. We're talking about 1898, 1899, when they're, you know, first discovered and studied. Um, it's an interesting thing because to me, I know that 200 years isn't, come on, that's not an exact number of years that these inscriptions have been on there, but that gives you a pretty at least a, a good idea of how old they were rather than 700 years, 600 years, 500 years. But it is interesting to think that at least in one analysis, it put the range of on, only around 200 years rather than, you know, the 500, 600 year range. Right. And even that, uh, even that measure is controversial, right? You'll find a lot of people who reject that. I just have to say, with this cast of characters, uh, who's who's the guy who made Spinal Tap, Best in Show? Christopher Guest. Christopher Guest, my yeah. man. Yeah, feels like Kensington Runestones would be a great Christopher Guest film. Oh, oh that's a really God. good idea. It would be. <laughs> there's a there's a really great, very small part in um, Waiting for Guffman where David uh, Cross plays like a historian or something, and he's talking about, or, or, you know, he's like a UFO uh, uh, enthusiast, and he said, in this circle. It, it uh, it's always two degrees colder with a five percent chance of rain. <laughs> <laughs> like he's out in the field. That's the only time you hear from David Cross in that movie. But I love that part. Such I a good movie. I wonder if they shot shot a bunch of other stuff and then it just ended up getting cut mm -hmm. on the on the cutting room floor. Oh, because uh, they they play. Yeah. They have a good time with those movies. It's all you know mostly improv. I think with like a, a skeletal outline. So I, I wouldn't doubt that that there's probably some good uh, outtakes somewhere out there in the world. Well, Chris, if you uh, if you are listening to the show, let us know 
uh, when you, we can expect your uh, feature film on the Kensington runestone and whether or not it is a hoax. Uh, this, there's one thing that I held back on that I think, uh, I, I think is substantive and should be mentioned. There are a lot of people in the area today, especially who say they believe in the veracity of the runestone. Now, is that a measure of sincere belief or is that sort of like a regional pride thing, right? Like how, um, I was going to say like how Atlanta still supports the Falcons, but I don't think yeah, like, need... like Blaine, Missouri and their stools. You know, that was another Christopher Guest reference. I'm just saying. <laughs> Let's keep it. Let's keep them both in. But uh, there was one great comparison I read from a linguistics expert about this. I'm just going to read this line to you guys. Just the one line. Remember when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon in 1969 and said, LMAO, this is tight. <laughs> That's uh, That language is off by about 50 years, says uh, linguist Jackson Crawford. And his argument is that the language of the Kensington runestone is off by about 600 years. He's an He's a, a old Norse specialist uh, with a PhD. So in his professional opinion, uh, this was written far after it claimed to be written. As a matter of fact, it may have been written around the late 1800s. Mm. Strange and suspect. It really just brings you back to the question, why, why would someone do this? And if it was the farmer, well, if, then why would he, I mean, why didn't he sell it for more money? Why didn't it become a tourist attraction of some sort? We've seen on this show several times throughout the years where in places across the United States, a hoax of some kind will begin and it takes on a life of its own. And even if it is proven to be a hoax, it becomes a museum or a place where you can go and see it. And, you know, the person who found it or the family can prosper from it, even if it is considered a hoax by everybody. I mean, it, it, it's a, it's something that can happen and it didn't seem to happen that way for Olaf. It, it just, it's very weird. And he didn't come forward to say, oh, yeah, this was a hoax later on in life. Um, nobody else did either. So maybe Olaf did discover something that someone else hoaxed, um, which is a possibility that we can't completely throw away. But it just, I don't know, none of it feels right. Or maybe it, maybe it just doesn't amount to much, I guess. That's why there's such a problem with it when I'm thinking about it. However, you can go and see it right now. It still yes. exists, and it's in a museum. In the Runestone Museum, right? Oh, yes, the Runestone Museum that you can visit now, though maybe you don't want to go in person. Maybe you can do it uh, virtually. But if you were going to go in person, it's at 206 Broadway, Alexandria, Minnesota, 56308. And, uh, you know, there's a phone number you can call, and you can see all this stuff and learn more about the Runestone itself, at least according to the museum at runestonemuseum.org. Yep. And while you're there, why not make a day of it? Uh, the Runestone Museum is just across the way. It's walking distance from the Legacy of the Lakes Museum. Mm. And uh, a, a I kid you not, a gigantic Viking statue. Nice. <laughs> so I well, the, and the, the yeah. Runestone, by the way, at the museum is displayed beautifully. It looks incredible. Mm -hmm. On that website, you can... You can see lots of pictures of it. Uh, there's some videos in there. There's, I think, a few ships, like Scandinavian ships. And there's a whole Scandinavian heritage exhibit there that's, I mean, I would say it's probably going to be worth your time. I'd love to go. Yeah, I agree. I would also uh, love to check this out. You can see the story of this. You can get a map of the county there. Uh, you can also uh, visit the Kensington Runestone Park which is a short drive from the museum. And you can learn more at the Kensington Heritage Society. We want to say again, there are people like th there are people who believe that this is an honest, the goshness Viking relic. And then there are other people to be candid, the majority of academics who believe that it is in some way an historical hoax, but don't let that ruin a good trip to the museum. You know what I mean? I, I, 
that's one of the only things I miss is I miss museums. I don't miss handshakes. Those are always, those have always been weird. Uh, yeah. Hugs, hugs are weird, but museums are great. Yeah. Museums were nice. And, and zoos. Yeah. Some zoos. zoos. I went to Some the, zoos. The, well, yeah, the Atlanta Zoo is back uh, up mm-hmm. and running. It's It's got COVID safe precautions in place with, uh, they only let a certain number of people in and I went, uh, and it wasn't too bad. And that's a good zoo. I think Atlanta Zoo is a good zoo because it's a lot of the animals that are in there wouldn't survive in the wild, which maybe some people take issue with that uh, version of events. I understand that, but it does. It, it, it sits okay with me. Yeah. And just because uh, the Kensington rune stone is likely a hoax, it doesn't mean that Viking relics, other Viking relics, aren't real. It doesn't mean uh, that there are not more strange tales of uh, pre-Columbus era exploration from Europeans. You'll you'll see all kinds of arguments. There's there's one that's pretty interesting uh, about Greek contact in the fourth century BCE uh, because a guy named J. Richard Steffi looked at the construction of a Greek ship from the 4th century and found they used a mixture of agave leaves and pitch. Where does agave grow? Interesting, right? It's not proof, but it's it's not fire, but it's smoke. Uh, you can also learn more about theories about the Priory of Sion and things like that, which are um, of varying plausibility. <laughs> and uh, and the, the legend of St. Brendan, the Irish monk, uh, the list goes on, but I, I think if we are doing due diligence and admitting when something seems like a hoax, even though the the story about it would be cool, I think when we're doing our due diligence there, we have to be careful to remember that this does not necess- this does not automatically mean every other controversial historical relic is somehow a hoax. Oh, a hundred percent. And I think it's important that we keep that kind of thing in the backs of our minds whenever we're exploring something like this. Like, even if, even if everybody says it's a hoax, let's at least think about it in, on the base context of what everybody else is working with before passing judgment. I think that's important. And to that end, we very much want to know what you think about the Kensington runestone uh, and, you know, any other thing that we just mentioned a few moments ago, but the Kensington runestone in particular, have you been, have you seen it? Have you heard any tales about it? Um, I'd love to know your experience at the museum again, just so I can live through, through your experience as I miss museums along with Ben and Noel and Paul. Uh, But yeah, you know, what other kind of stuff about, you know, pre-contact pre-Columbus contact from Europeans here in the Americas, uh, what, what do you think about all of that stuff? You can contact us. We're all over social media on Twitter and Facebook. We are conspiracy stuff on Instagram. We are conspiracy stuff show. That's right. If you want to get a hold of us uh, in a different way, you can join our Facebook group, which is called Here's Where It Gets Crazy. Easy as pie to get in. Just uh, name a name. Any name will do. An interesting name. A name from uh, conspiracy history, uh, but, but preferably a name of, of myself or Matt or Ben or Mission Control or uh, Doc Holiday, uh, and you're in. Uh, or just make Ben laugh. Yes, yes. Uh, someone had a great, uh, a great pun, and I, I was laughing so hard that I just, I just approved you. And I'm sorry, I should have saved it for the air. Uh, but yes, yes. Let us know. We try to be easy to find. Uh, if you don't sip the social meads, uh, if uh, going online is not your bag of badgers, uh, then we have a different rune stone for you to hit up to contact us. Uh, check out the series of uh, numerical hieroglyphs on your phone, your telephonic device, and uh, cast a spell. You know, cast one eight three three. Say it with us: S T D W Y T K, and you will speak directly into a void that may speak back. That's right, Rel Poor on one eight three three S T D W Y T K. Rel Poor, everyone. Uh, <laughs> well, right over yeah. my head, baby. That's all good. That's all about online. There's, there's three people listening that got that, and I hope you appreciate it uh, as much as I do. Yeah, because I think we're, I think we're lost, man. We're trying to yes. Oh, it's Andy, all good, but... guys. Just gather as much blood moss and man mandrake root. I think 
If you just gather a bunch of that, you need those reagents. What was that uh, one uh, from uh, the uh, Skyrim, Ben? The dragon yell. Those were rune-based, weren't they? Yeah, Fustora, indeed. That's the one, Fustora! Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, and if you don't want to do any of that, you can send us a good old Fustora. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.